Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, okay, we're on. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, honored to have such a full room for our talk. Um, so we're going to uh, go ahead and get underway. Okay. So um, our talk today, with uh, respect to uh, Jeffrey Moore and his classic uh, Crossing the Chasm, um, is about the idea of taking a consulting model and scaling it. How do you go from a service to software as a service, and what are the challenges therein, uh, and the, the particular set that we learned in our, along the way that we've called uh, the concierge chasm. So we start in a place that most startups are pretty familiar. So uh, the prevalent wisdom is to start with a consulting model. Learn as much as you can before you code anything at all. Figure out how to deliver some value to your customer and get that learning cycle going as quickly as possible. And we were in a pretty cool place. So what do you do when you have paying customers, but then you're struggling through the process of what do I do now? How do I scale this process? So you're, you have a consulting model, you have paying customers, you're starting, you're in a position where something just has changed. Your small startup team has gone from going through your learning cycles to now supporting existing customers and it's starting to drain the, the energy and the capacity of your team. You can't pick up new customers because you don't have the capacity to, and so you, you're in a position where you're looking to figure out how to scale. So what do you do? Well, the Lean Startup Playbook says, well, now's your time to figure out how to build something scalable. You build an MVP, you go out, and you test it. And so we said, okay, great, let's go and do that. And so the questions arose when, what happens when you've been selling a service, you have a repeatable process for that, you build a piece of software that supposedly does what your service was doing, what you were doing manually, and all of a sudden that thing isn't selling. So we struggled through that and said, okay, taking a step back, what did we learn? What do we really know? What are the validated learnings and what were our assumptions? And it was our resetting process uh, that led us to these uh, five points that we'll get here on our theories of crossing the concierge chasm. So I'm Khalid Smith. And I'm Nicole Tucker Smith. Okay. And uh, we're the founders of Lesson Cats. We have a uh, software service that we sell to teacher preparation programs that's used uh, for training teachers. Um, but really the key for this talk is really that most people who are going through uh, scaling a software service can probably relate uh, as we struggle through this process. And so these are five of the things that we thought were universally applicable to businesses, particularly B2B businesses, that were trying to scale a, uh, a service model. So number one sounds pretty self-evident, but uh, it wasn't for us. So it was start at the beginning. And what I mean by that is that this is where we were when we were in the problem that I mentioned before. We felt like we had a scalable, uh, we, we felt like we had a repeatable sales process. We had a business model, we were bootstrapped, we were earning enough money to support our team, we had customers, but we had no product. And so we said, okay, let's go and we'll build this product. And so obviously the next thing that we need to test and validate is product market fit, right? We need to know, and so we built our questionnaires on do you, do you like our product or love our product? Like those are, those are the questions that we want to know, right? And, um, as we were going through this, this validation process, like all of a sudden, our, uh, our conversion rates were a big fat zero. And we said, wow, like we thought we were now building a product and we were about to go and start validating product market fit. And what we realized is we're not here, we were here, right? So it goes without, it's, it's, it's obvious in retrospect that your software service is not gonna have the same sales and marketing plan, it's not going to follow the same business model, it's not going to leverage the same funnels. Uh, it really, as we talk, isn't really necessarily even going to appeal to the same customers. You're not gonna have the same problem solution fit. So all that stuff we had to throw out the window and start over at the beginning. So it's a pretty humbling process. 
Um, and so our first learning, our first theorem was go back and start over. Go look for those early adopters characterized by extreme pain. Restart your, your problem solution uh, interview process. If Ashmar Yura is here, like, dude, you rock because I use your stuff as a Bible uh, running lean in terms of uh, the, the processes for the, um, for the problem solution interviews. But it also meant that we needed to go and or maintain a hand-to-hand -hand sales process where we thought once we started building the software, we were gonna go right to this scalable online process of you know go to the website, click here, and sign up. So, what is it then that we could do with all of that stuff that we thought we learned doing our consulting model? Well, first we needed to unpack our baggage. And here's an example. So what would you build in order to automate this personal chef service? Okay, frozen dinners, all right. We weren't expecting real answers, but that's okay. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead to the next slide. Frozen dinners is an option, but the truth is that it depends. Because how do we know what value the customer is actually buying? In this consulting model, we're actually lumping together multiple problems and solutions, and we don't necessarily know what value our customers are trying to purchase. And so if we're trying to then automate this, how do we know which service to automate? Do we need to build four different MVPs? How do we know which value we need to be providing and automating for our customers? So then we had to think again, all right, we've been providing this consulting service. Apparently we've been solving multiple problems. How much validated learning can we really take from all that consulting? What are we really sure of? And unfortunately, the answer was not as much as we originally thought that we knew, but all of that consulting was not for nothing. So what was the point? So the point of the consulting model was that while the solutions that you develop as a consultant are not directly applicable to you when you try to scale and build a software model, what was applicable was your understanding of the problem. So consulting is really great at allowing you to see a lot of problems and really get into understanding this and, and knowing what to build when you build your solution. So in our case, and particularly for B2B customers, what our advantage was is that we had direct access to customers and to users. So we were selling to teachers' colleges and the professors were using us and they were asking us to then, they were in turn asking their teaching candidates, people who are learning how to teach, to use our software. And oftentimes we were working side by side with the professors. We would go to their class, help them use the software and we got, that, we got experience with the teaching candidates in terms of the challenges that they were facing, what problems they were having, and what, we, what features we needed to build into our software. So in the end, we started to feel like we understood the problem even a little bit more than the customer and could help inform them on what needed to happen. Secondly, we also had access to these, this customer base. And we had a, 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 a cadre of customers that we were still consulting with. And as we began to develop different MVPs, we started to position ourselves a little bit differently. We started to say, well, instead of just consulting and solving this problem for you, let's follow a coaching model. And we're gonna, we're gonna help you guys learn to solve your own problems. And oh, by the way, here's some software that you may be able to use that can help you figure out what your problem was. And in essence, and if any of you know the Tom Sawyer fence analogy, right? we had folks pay us to validate and work with our MVPs. And we stood by and watched as they did that and tried to say as little as possible. And in that process, we learned not only what problems they were having with the software, but actually what they thought they were buying. So when they would have problems with one aspect and say, oh, but what I really need is this, then we understood that they were purchasing a completely different value proposition. And it helped us really get clear on how many different benefits we needed to add into our MVP in order for it to be sufficient and appeal to this customer base. So unpacking the baggage was about exploiting access to the end users to develop superior UX, and it was also about testing these hybrid service slash um, uh, software as a service MVPs that allowed us to disaggregate the value proposition and figure out whether you were buying frozen dinners or whether you were buying a dishwashing service when you hired that personal chef. So as we attempted to isolate 
which problems we were actually solving for our customers, we actually came to the conclusion that maybe it was none of the above. Instead of trying to find multiple problems, we needed to find one central problem that we could then call our villain. And so as we transitioned from consulting to providing service as a software, we understood that our early adopters were experiencing and expressing a different type of pain. So their pain was more intense, it was higher order, and this was different from our more general customer base that had broader pain points. And an, a, a, a common example for this is the hybrid. So the early adopters, yay, let's save the environment whereas the broader customer base may be more interested in how much they're going to save gas. That might be a more of a motivating factor in purchasing um, that product. So recognizing that we needed to shift our focus to a different type of pain point and understanding that, that we may be trying to struggle through multiple problems, we needed to find that central villain that spoke to this wider audience. And we're defining the villain as one that threatens the status quo and creates this need for change. Because the truth is that for our customers who were using our software, it was going to be a habit change for them. It was going to require them to do some things differently. And in working with institutions, and this is quite common in education, change is hard. And we did not want our software to be the culprit for requiring them to make this change. Instead, our software is not the culprit, it's the solution to the villain, and the villain is responsible for the customers having to make this change. So it was up to us to embrace the villain. So how does this analogy necessarily apply to the startup world? So without taking you down too many roads that lead to Comic-Con, um, this is about, number one, knowing a villain is about using your access. It's about understanding your customer first knowing what their capabilities are, what problems they can handle, and what problems they can't handle. Being able to anticipate what's going to happen so that you can be ready to help them. <clears throat> so, Batman is friends with the police chief. Right. Number two, you choose a nemesis, right? So a nemesis is not just a problem. A nemesis is a problem that you know inside out, upside down, that you have tailored your solution to fix that is seemingly your reason for being on this earth. You are great at solving this particular problem, and you pick one that is relevant to your capabilities that you can solve. So Batman's the Joker versus Yellow Lantern, who everyone knows would crush Batman. But anyway, um, three. <laughs> um, nemesis, or so finding this nemesis and creating a solution for it is about stopping the disruption. A nemesis is often a problem that is so broad and large that you're not going to necessarily solve it for the customer. That's not your goal. Your goal is to manage and prevent this nemesis from disrupting the life of your customer. So it's about understanding that regulation and knowing what it is and being ahead of the changes and being able to address that with your customer proactively and say, here's what I'm going to do with you. Here's what you need to do. Sorry. So anyway, so addressing the nemesis is about becoming a preventative solution. It helps to couch all these different, whether you're a food service business or a dishwashing business, all of those individual problem solutions just become secondary benefits. And your real solution that you talk about is that we are a preventative solution for this change that is occurring. So Batman has the tool belt, but he doesn't sell a tool belt. What he sells is, I'm a solution for the crime problems that you can't handle. So again, finding the villain is about choosing the nemesis. Blaming the nemesis for the disruption. Don't allow your software to introduce the idea for the change. Building the UX around stopping the disruption, not necessarily solving the problem. And then your core value is around your ability to protect your consumer, to educate them about the problem, and to prevent disruption. So this is a le the next one is a lesson on what not to do. The fourth theory is about automating the customer's chores and not their core. Mm -hmm. All right, so we learned the hard way not to confuse our customer's core identity with their core concern. So when working with teacher preparation programs, we figured their core concern, what kept them up at night was whether or not they were preparing their teachers for the classrooms of today. And when we were working as consultants, this line of thinking was okay. They were okay with us as consultants helping them achieve this core identity. But then when we introduced the software to now address this task, that became a threat. It turns out that having a human help you is seen as help. Having software replace what you're supposed to do is a threat. 
So instead, we repositioned our, uh, our communication and said we have a tool to help you better prepare the teachers for the challenges of today. And again, well, our customers were not necessarily insulted by that line of thinking. They were uh, open with us and saying, you know what, we feel pretty confident in our ability to prepare the teachers for today, but we are annoyed with this new regulation that's requiring us to capture these large amounts of data and then having to prove whether or not our program is effective. And so that is what's really bothering us. And then we happened to mention that we had built into our software a tagging system to help us manage our own data. And would you want to take a look at that? And lo and behold, that's exactly what they were looking for. So what seemed to be a minor feature for us actually uncovered major benefits for our customers. So one of the things to keep in mind is as you move to uh, introducing a service, to be willing to take on the less glamorous chores so that the customer can then own the uh, achievement of achieving their core identity. And then our fifth point was getting by some little help from our friends. And uh, the, the core of this idea is really that you, you didn't have to make such, or we didn't have to make such a hard and fast transition between our service model and our software as a service model. Um, we learned through the process of developing these hybrid MVPs that um, there were value added that the customer still wanted and wanted that reassurance. So think about TurboTax where they'll do your taxes for you or help you do your taxes, you get the credit for it. But if you still want somebody to come and check it, you can go and have that service available. And so continuing to add those services as premium add-ons allowed us to continue to use both sales cycles. So as we were working on one, starting up the, the software as a service sales cycle, we can continue to use the other one and continue to grow by uh, adding some additional services onto our uh, scalable model. Secondly, um, just by definition almost, automating a process that you are doing manually creates structure and data. And as the saying goes, data is the new oil. And what we found as we were uh, talking with our customers was that there was a, a large and untapped value proposition that we had, which was around the metadata associated with the students and their learning and then the learning artifacts that were created. And so uh, almost universally applicable, if you're doing something manually as a service and then begin to automate that process, look inside for the metadata associated with that because it's not only a valuable new revenue stream, but it's a, it's a convincing way to help your customers transition from being coddled and have that uh, concierge service to now saying, oh, I'm willing to go and use this software, not only because it's going to do this stuff and it's going to be a little cheaper, but it's actually going to give me some additional data and some structure and some organization that's going to allow me some better results. So, the, remembering lastly that the whole point of doing the consulting model in the first place was for you to learn, earn while you learn. And so you can continue to do that by having this hybrid approach in your transition that we didn't have to do so hard and fast. So our five theories for crossing the concierge chasm, start at the beginning. Understand that there's the solutions don't translate, but your understanding of the problem does. Unpack the baggage. Learn what your customers were actually purchasing because a consulting model all usually condenses a lot of benefits on top of each other, and by disaggregating those, you can learn what needs to be built into your MVP. Find the villain. Don't let your software be the reason why the behavior change needs to happen. By understanding a villain and knowing and being able to proactively tell a customer where the world is changing, you can position yourself as a preventative solution with a minor habit change versus the reason why they have to undergo some change. Automate the chores, not the corpse. So again, recognizing that a person helping you do a task is looked at very differently as software helping you do a task, and that that positioning might need to change because of people's inherent threateningness and real threats of being replaced by machinery, um, but also their core identity and saying, a machine can't do this as well as I can. Uh, and it's also giving up a little bit of that, needing them to acknowledge that benefit and saying, okay, you can buy this for whatever reason you might think you're buying it for, even though this might help you do other things. Uh, so a good concierge helps you uh, without you necessarily having to say, this is where I need help. And then lastly, getting by, selling a little help to your friends. So this is about uh, making sure that you can um, continue one model to continue generating revenue while you're starting the other. So 
I'm Khalid, and this is my wife, Nicole, and we're the founders of LessonCast.com. We write quite a bit on the intersection of education and lean startup principles, and a little bit about uh, our transition from a software model to a scalable uh, software model. But as conclusion, uh, we recognize that if we share with you five points, we'll be lucky if you take away one. So collapsed here is our unify theory for crossing the concierge chasm. <laughs> and that as you transition to uh, building software as a service, remember to focus on helping customers manage their disruptions so that they're able to ultimately take credit for the resulting benefits. Thank you. Questions yes, or, yeah, questions. so you, you guys tell me. So, no. you have, I think we have time for two questions. Sure, sir. So, uh, did you have any team that you had to uh, you had to train to switch from the services model, and if so, how you did that? Uh, huh. So, um, small, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, our, our small team was uh, ourselves and our developer and our designer. And so yeah, so we had uh, two kind of collaborating educators who were also helping us with dealing with some of the customer service challenges. And, and really, the, 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 it was less about transitioning the team as much as it was like, this is, this is my teacher resource, right? So I'm on the product side, like I'm developing stuff, right? And she's really the one helping us work through the sales cycles, the relationships with the customers. And when they call, they don't want to speak to me, they want to speak to her. And so they're, 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 she's spending a lot of her time in supporting those customers, giving them uh, feedback, going to these actual classes, and so the product development cycle and all the other innovation processes stop because I'm, I, I, I need her to be able to make that process go. And so we started bringing in other people to help us sort of manage that, but then we, we began to see that it was gonna be, we were never gonna be able to restart the learning process until we started going to a scalable model. And it does require us to then develop more digital. Yes. So yeah. Learning, it's about learning. like really setting timelines and saying, okay, from nine to twelve, we're gonna do existing customer support. And I'm sorry if you call after twelve thirty, like we're gonna send you a little note that says we'll get back to you tomorrow and blah blah blah. And then at, from from one till you know midnight is about like future learnings and, and getting the learning cycle moving. Good question though. One more? Yeah. So Khalid, you mentioned that automating processes create structure. Yes. Is that a barrier to acceptance of your product? Or? Um, well, I, no, actually. So I, I'd say that you know what we found was it was one of the best selling points. So without getting geeky on education stuff, um, what we helped people really do is manage the proliferation of standards. So there's a ton of people both inside and outside of education who are really interested in education reform and what's happening is that there are some standards that are gaining a lot of momentum that necessarily aren't rooted in a lot of research. And so the community sees that, the education community sees that and says, well, I see it coming, I'm being forced to do it, but I know there's gonna be another one next year. And I know there's gonna be another one after that. And what we began to see was that we could position ourselves as you don't have to worry about the one that's gonna come next year and the one that's gonna come after that. We can help you manage and structure your process so that we can map whatever you're doing now to whatever the standard is going to be next year and the standard is going to be after that. And so while they weren't so interested in this idea of accepting that there are some opportunities and improving the way that we prepare teachers to teach, they were really interested in this idea of, I know there's gonna be a change coming next year and I know there's gonna be another one and you're gonna help me stay ahead of that. Thank you very much. Awesome.